Are we okay? Are you okay now, AJ? Yeah. Okay, good evening to everyone. Welcome in our BISPER meeting tonight. And we, Vancouver, Filipino, and North Shore are the host, but I'm the only one. <laughs> the representative of this church. And the reason why I did not tell them that we are the host because in my mind and in my plan, we will just watch a video today and tonight. It's a live video of our president, Pastor Brad Torp. I don't know if you are aware that there is ongoing online evangelism. It's, they started last Friday, Friday and Saturday, and tonight is the third episode, and then tomorrow, and then it will be by weekend, Friday and Saturday, until December 16, or December 17, I think. So this duration are the evangelism, and I shared the link in our group chat of Vancouver Rangers, and also in FAABC group chat. Hoping that everyone will share also to their friends as I shared it already to my friends in Messenger and in Facebook. And yes, it's a part of our online evangelism. But before I pray, let me read to you the Text in Hebrews chapter four, uh, chapter twelve, verses four. Continue. It says there that in New International Version, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, "My son." Do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. May this text be our inspiration also, as we will watch tonight. And the, th uh, the topic that Pastor Bradshaw, our president of British Columbia Conference, will discuss tonight is, why do good people suffer from evil? Why do good people suffer from evil? And it will be answered tonight. But before we watch, shall we pray? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, we would like to praise you and thank you for gathering us together in this place, together with our brethren who are watching online or in Facebook Live here in Vancouver Filipino Church website or Facebook account. We pray, Lord, that may you bless all of us. And as we will watch this video, hoping and praying that those interests also, whom they will watch this, they will have that clear understanding about what is happening right now. And this is just what Jesus mentioned as signs of the times that we need to be ready for Jesus' second coming. We pray, Lord, that may you bless all of us and your presence will be in us. Thank you, Lord, for blessing Pastor Brad Thorpe as he will share your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our IT are ready now that we will just watch in our TV and then 
I will give a reflection after this one. Thank you. When you look at our world, it is filled with so much sickness and suffering and death, and pain, and it's good people often who are suffering in a terrible, terrible way. And our hearts cry out, why are those things happening? Thank you so much for joining us today for this study of Daniel and Revelation. Our whole series is looking at the great prophetic themes of these two amazing books in the Bible. And I know you're going to be thrilled as you discover insights and understanding for the topic of today. This week, I received a phone call and had a lengthy discussion with a very good friend of mine, colleague in ministry. And after decades of working and serving and, and ministering with his wife, they discovered just a few days ago that she is very, very ill with a serious cancer. Why do those things happen? You know, friend, when you look at our world, it is filled with so much sickness and suffering and death, pain, and it's good people often who are suffering in a terrible, terrible way. And our hearts cry out, why are those things happening? Well, that's our topic today because we're going to be looking at the framework of prophecy. Uh, this is a picture that my aunt uh, has painted. She's quite an artist, and uh, she had many, many different art uh, pieces of, art, of painting. And uh, I appreciate this particular one, but you know what's really interesting is when you put the painting, and then you put it in a frame. <laughs> Excuse my putting this around my face, but the framework helps to understand the beauty of the picture itself. And today, we're looking at the big framework of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. So it's going to be an exciting opportunity to get right into these uh, themes and to study a little bit uh, in a, a deeper, deeper way what uh, these books have to say. Now, as we look at these prophecies, I want to kind of build these uh, sequence of topics. It's a link in the chain, step by step. We go along, our first topic was on the purpose of prophecy. I, I'm giving you the essence, not the title, but the purpose of prophecy. And our first presentation focused in on what uh, is the, what was the purpose of prophecy? It was to help to see the other world, the world that we don't ordinarily see with our human vision. It's the unseen, the supernatural. It was to understand the future. It gives us assurance and understanding that there is a God who is guiding and directing the affairs of this world. And I like the most of all, it is to help us. Prophecy is to help us to make eternity real. When you and I understand the great flow of history and the predictions and how prophecy reveals that God is guiding and directing the affairs of this world, it helps us to see that there is a supernatural, there is an eternity, and by God's grace, you and I can be part of that. Topic number two uh, was is the overview of prophecy. Uh, where, where is this world heading as far as the great prophets and prophecies are concerned? We were looking at Daniel chapter two and uh, the climax of history, the head of gold, breasted arms of silver, thighs of brass and legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay and the great stone that comes and smashes the image and fills the whole world. The second coming of Jesus Christ is, is uh, portrayed in that symbol. Well, friend, when you and I look at these things, we want to look in a deeper way today at what is the meta story, what is the frame of the entire prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. So please pause with me for a moment. And let's ask God to bless us. You know, the real teacher is our Heavenly Father, not me. I'm simply a few words, and by God's grace, what I'm saying goes speak to your heart as what God wants each one of us to understand from the teachings of the Bible. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the revelation that you have given to this world of your will, of your way, of your love, of how much you appreciate each one of us. And as we look at this meta story from uh, Bible prophecy, give us insight and practical application to our situation today. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Now, as we look at our world today and what all is involved in the affairs of this world, we're going to go back 605 years before Jesus Christ. 605 years before Jesus Christ. That's approximately 2,600 years ago. Now, that's a long time. And uh, the events here are very interesting. 
uh, it was in 605 BC that King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the new young king of uh, the Empire of Babylon, he had uh, taken over from his father Nabopolassar, who had passed away, and he came to the uh, city of, of Jerusalem, the little kingdom of Judah, a kind of a keystone kingdom in the land of Palestine. If, if anybody wanted to go from Asia or from Europe down to Africa or vice versa, they had to go through this little land bridge and this big empire uh, of Babylon, which was growing and expanding in a significant way, came along and rolled over, steamrolled, if you please, this, uh, uh, this kingdom of Babylon. And it says here, now what, what I want us to catch here is the, is the uh, passage here from Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, <laughs> it's so succinct, but there is some profound lessons here. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, who was the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now that seems so simple. Here is this powerful king, Nebuchadnezzar, who comes and he conquers this little kingdom, and he takes the treasures from the temple of Jerusalem, takes some of the pots and pans from Jerusalem, and he carries them over to Babylon. Now, from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, people would say, well, no big deal. It's the big kingdom conquers the little kingdom. This is the strong conquering the weak. It's the process of evolution. But notice here what the Bible says the Lord gave. Now, we're going to come back to that theme in one of our future topics. How on earth did, why on earth, yeah, why on earth did God allow or give the empire, the kingdom of, of Judah, and the <laughs> temple, and the sacred articles of, of worship into the treasure house, to the Nebuchadnezzar, to the house of the gods of Babylon? We're looking here at a very, very common problem in, the, in, in, in life. Why do good people suffer from evil? Now friends, 600 and year, 605 years before Jesus Christ, Daniel, the man who wrote this book, uh, wrote this prophecy, Daniel who wrote this was approximately somewhere between 15 and 20 years of age. He was a mid-late teenager. So here we find a, a simple account. Babylonian armies come in, surround the city, conquer it, and pack Daniel and his friends off to Babylon. Now, there is four that are specifically <coughs> mentioned here in Daniel chapter 1. and But they, the Bible tells us that they were part of a bigger group. We're going to go to that in a future topic. They, they encountered a very interesting situation of a test of how of how they were going to relate to the to the educational system in the University of Babylon. They were in King's College, and and uh, the uh, Dean of Students, Ashpenaz, had all sorts of favors to show to them. But I want us to focus in here on the fact that Daniel and his three friends, the four of them, are taken captive to Babylon. But they were good people. They were good guys. When, when you study the entire chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel was faithful to God. He was a person of integrity. It, the, the book of Daniel, and, and we're going to see this in coming chapters, revealed that he studied his Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible, regularly. He prayed regularly. He was faithful in, in all of his uh, service and duties. And that was the kind of man who grew up in Jerusalem. And along with his Four friends, three friends, and, and a whole group of other young people, they were taken captive to the land of Babylon, about probably somewhere in the area of close to a thousand kilometers, marched over the desert. And the prophecies, and we're going to go into this in a future presentation, the prophecies have predicted that the kingdom of Judah would be taken captive and, and they would be serving as eunuchs, as servants uh, in the kingdom of Babylon, and the, Daniel fulfilled that prophecy. Why? Now, 
we, we can focus on a number of different things from these passages, but I want us to focus in a special way on this theme of why is there so much, where, where did this conflict between people who are good and why is, does evil befall them? Because that's a challenge that faces us today. So let's go here to Revelation chapter 12. Now, please, excuse me, please keep in mind, friend, that, the, that we're studying Daniel and Revelation. And I want us to see the themes that are common to both, because if you're, you and I are going to understand these great prophecies, we need to understand the big story. And so we're, we're, we're going back and forth today in our studies between Daniel and Revelation and also the teachings of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels, because I want us to see this big picture, because as you get it, it gives a lot of understanding. Revelation chapter 12, and war broke out in heaven. No, there's supposed to be no war up in heaven. Everybody says there's peace and joy and there's no, uh, no pain and suffering and difficulty. Here it says war be began in heaven. Michael, that's another one of the, the names of, of our Savior Jesus Christ, and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Now, friend, notice, here it describes a conflict, a fight, a battle, an actual war that began up in heaven. It says, nor was place found for them in heaven any longer. So that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan. Here he is, cast out. There is actually territory. And there is conflict. And in that territory, Satan, it says here, the serpent is cast out. But notice here what I, I want us to notice, because this is we're putting a number of things together here in, in our study today. The serpent is actually the devil. His name is Satan. Now that's really important in Bible prophecy, friend, because if we're going to understand Bible prophecy, we need to understand the symbols, the metaphors, the deeper spiritual message behind what, what the prophets, Prophet Daniel and Prophet John, were actually writing, because they see heavenly things, and just like the cartoonists of today will, will draw a political cartoon, so God, through a picture, is showing so much more of the actual spiritual battles that are taking place in the supernatural world. Okay, let's go on a little bit further. Well, this, let, let's drop, drop back here, excuse me. We go back here, it says, the, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who uh, deceives the whole world. Okay, here's something else that happened. The devil deceives the whole world. Now, it's only the gullible, the naive, who sit back and just say, oh, whatever's, whatever's happening around us is what is really true. No, he deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here the Bible is telling us in the symbols of, of the dragon and the serpent that there is a war up in heaven and Jesus and God were in a battle with uh, Lucifer, with Satan, and cast him out of heaven. Going on, we find here this great dragon is called the devil and Satan. There is a, the book of Revelation, the books of Daniel reveals a struggle between good and evil. So, friend, when you and I look at the framework of Bible prophecy, when we see the big picture, we have to put into the context of the framework this whole battle, this controversy, this war that is taking place between good and evil. Okay, let's go on a little bit further. We have to ask the question, why was there war in heaven? Where did this dragon come from? Now, I want to make very, very clear here, friend, that the Bible does not teach dualism. Some of you who are familiar with theology and philosophy would say, oh, Brad is uh, presenting the idea of dualism. And, and first of all, I want us to see what a definition of dualism is. This comes from Encyclopedia Britannica. In religion, dualism means the belief in two supreme opposed powers or gods that or sets of divine or demonic beings that cause the world to exist. Dualism says that there are equal powers, one good, one evil. Both of those are responsible for the creation of everything in this world and universe. And so they see it as two equal opposing powers. My friends, the Bible does not teach dualism. Rather, it teaches monotheism, and it teaches 
that the supreme God who eternally has existed, and these are some of the characteristics. I only selected some of them because it gives us the essence of what, what we see here in the two definitions. The supreme eternal God has created all matter. He has created all things. He sustains everything. He has a perfect plan for this world. But going on from that, he has revealed himself. And that's what is so important in understanding about the Bible and about the revelation of nature, about the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's most of all, through Jesus Christ, who is the supreme revelation. But the point here is that God has revealed himself and we are not left in this world where we only see and, and touch the tactile things that we're familiar with in the material world that we're aware of. There is more to it. There is the eternal supernatural world that the Bible is part of the revelation of God and how God is actually at work. <clears throat> now, next point. He loves this world so much that he came to this world to redeem it. That's what the whole life and ministry of Jesus Christ is all about. That's what the prophecies about the Messiah are so real. Friend, do you know all of the tremendous prophecies that were given about Jesus Christ? The reality that he lived, this Galilean tradesman, a carpenter, who lived for 33 years and who never traveled more than a few miles. The, the reality, the reality, my friend, of the historicity of Jesus Christ, of his death, of his, of his resurrection, of his ascension, the impact that that has made on his world. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. And it is because of that huge revelation that we, as individuals, can trust not only him, but also the other ways in which God has revealed as well. Well, next point. He will soon return to this world. That's what prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 and many other prophecies that we studied about last week are all about. And most importantly, this great God, the eternal, almighty God of the universe, is interested in a personal relationship with you, my friend. Not just something with the world. No, friend, you are deeply important to God. You are the reason why he has came to reveal himself. And as when we look at this great drama of the ages of Satan who has attacked and done everything he can to destroy the image of God and his plan and his, who's attacked you and me and our families and our environment and our, our co uh, collective cultures, my friend, we see this in this battle that is taking place in this world. And that, my friend, is helping us to understand the great contests that are described in, in Bible prophecy. Now, there's, a, there's an important dimension here to, to raise because I want to very respectfully recognize that there are some people who come from an atheistic, skeptical background, maybe agnostic. And I, I come back to the, to the trilemma, which is expressed by Epicurus, a Greek philosopher of many centuries ago. And the question uh, is relating to the existence and continuation of pain. It's the greatest challenge for believers. It's the reason why many people accept atheism. Well, David Hume, who was a English philosopher of several centuries ago, formulated it this way. He took the statement of Epicurus and he said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able to? Then if that's the case, he's impotent, he has no power. Is he, God, able to, able but not willing? If that's the case, then he is malevolent. He is an evil character. So the question that comes to us, the thinking person who really stops to consider why, if there is an almighty, powerful God, does pain continue? Now, we're going to look at a very, at a partial answer to that today. But friend, you need to understand in, in, in seeing the big drama, the, the meta story of, of prophecy, we need to see this great battle that is taking place. I want us to go to the words of Jesus. It was Jesus who gives us insight and understanding as to what the real answer of, uh, is to this question of, of pain and suffering. One day, Jesus told a story and he said... And he described it this way. He said there was this real wealthy man, this farmer went out and planted this huge big field. And they had weeded it ahead of time. And when they planted it, it was perfect. In ancient times, 
if you didn't like if somebody didn't like you and you were a farmer they would pick up weeds thorns and all sorts of burrs and you know, ugly weeds and they would go plant them in the field so that the crop lost its value so in the story that jesus tells he says there's this wealthy man who made a perfect great big world and his servants went out and they found that the field had weeds so they came to the master to the business man said what do you want us to do should we go pull them out right now and he said no wait till the harvest and we'll pull them out but notice this key word he this key phrase he said to them an enemy has done this now what jesus was talking about here friend is the fact that he was describing the enemy as the one who had sowed the weeds who'd sowed all of these horrible things in the field. And that is a, a metaphor, a symbol. The, the field is a symbol of the world. The weeds are a symbol of the evil and the problems of pain and suffering and death in this world. Jesus recognized the existence of an enemy who is responsible for the problems in this world. Jesus, in another situation, met a lady who was very sick. She'd been sick for 18 years. And... The situation was that it was the Sabbath, and the big contest of, uh, of the time of Jesus Christ was not which day was the Sabbath, but rather what you should or should not do on the Sabbath. Jesus set such a positive example of, of how to properly keep the Sabbath, and he said, speaking of this lady who'd been sick for 18 years, he said, so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abram, meaning she's part of the, uh, the Jewish faith at that time, whom Satan has bound. Think of it. For 18 years, shouldn't she be loose from her bond on the Sabbath? <laughs> There's a couple things that I really love about that passage. Jesus looked at this terrible example of suffering, this poor lady, and he said, wow, 18 years. I must do something to help her right now. But beyond that, he said, whom Satan has bound. Do you know about somebody who's sick? You've had an accident? Think of a war? Think of catastrophe like a tornado, a hurricane? Think of those things. These are the things that Jesus said. Satan is the one who is responsible for those things. It is Jesus himself who believed in the power and the influence of this evil being called Satan. Another example, John 12, verse 31. He talks about, he says, now is the judgment. Now, Jesus was going to be dying in just a few hours from his statement here. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world will be cast out. Jesus recognized that Satan, Lucifer, this evil one, was the ruler of this world. Now, let's put that together for a second. In the book of Revelation, it describes Satan being, there's a war that began in heaven, and then Satan is cast out. And so he's down here on this earth, and it's, he's described as the ruler. There is a war that is taking place, and you and I are on a battlefield. That's what's happening in our world of ours. Now, uh, let's go back and look at some more dimensions of prophecy. We're going to go to the book of Isaiah chapter 14. Now, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about Isaiah. There's three, three uh, major big books of prophecy in, in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. There's Isaiah, there's Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Daniel, four, excuse me, four books. Now, Isaiah lived about 100 years before prophet Daniel. Jeremiah was a contemporary, so lived at the same time as Daniel. But he lived and ministered in the land of, pa of Palestine, in Judea. He stayed with the uh, Jewish people even after some of them had been taken captive by, by, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. Then Ezekiel was also a contemporary of Daniel, and he was with the Jewish people who were the prisoners of war in the area of Babylon or formerly Assyria. It was all of that territory. He was with the common people. So here we have four prophets. Isaiah, who lived before. Uh, Jeremiah, who's with the people in Judea. We have Ezekiel, who's with the common people in Babylon. And then we have Daniel. <laughs> At this time of supreme test 
of understanding what was so difficult and the terrible things that had happened. God had these prophets working with, with the people, comforting and encouraging them. But now here's Isaiah. Isaiah is writing, and he's describing the, the, this evil, malevolent, horrible being. He says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Huh, what a bunch of I, I, I's. And here we catch a glimpse of the egoism that is at the heart of the very rebellion that Lucifer, Satan, has launched against God. I, I, the mount of the congregation on the side of the north. That's a metaphor to describe Mount Sinai. When the people of Israel came to Mount Sinai, the Sinai, the mountain was up to the north, and it was from the, from the mountain that the people heard the Ten Commandments. I will sit on the mount of the congregation, the mount of the congregation was Sinai, on the sides of the north. I will be the one who gives the laws. Lucifer, Satan, wanted to be the one who was the lawgiver, the one who commanded the respect, uh, the loyalty, the allegiance, and the worship of all the people. But I want you to notice that Isaiah said, how are you fallen from heaven? How are you fallen from heaven, Lucifer? Remember, Revelation said that there was war began up in heaven and he was cast out of heaven, comes down to this earth. We go to the book of Ezekiel, okay? Here's another prophet. He's describing him again. He says, you have set your heart as the heart of a god. I am going to be the king. I'm going to be the boss. I'm going to be the allegiance. You see, my friends, this is not dualism. This isn't two equal forces that are fighting over, the, over this world. No, no. There is the supreme, almighty, eternally existing God who created all things, all material things, who sustains all those things. You remember a moment ago we went over those characteristics, and Lucifer says, I want to have, I want to be the God who does this. Going on, that says the Lord God, you were, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And then, now, now keep that text in mind because we're going to see a picture in a second that is really interesting. Lucifer is not some ugly being. He's the seal of perfection. He won the beauty contest. He was Miss Universe, if you please. Full of wisdom. I mean, more brilliant than any scholar, any savant who has ever memorized anything and everything in this in, in the library, libraries of this world. He was perfect in beauty. You were the anointed cherub that covers. Anointed cherub, right in the, in this, in the symbolism of the ancient sanctuary, there was an ark where the Ten Commandments in stone were kept, somewhat like this, uh, uh, this uh, chest that the TV is resting on. And inside of that was the Ten Commandments. And over that were these arcs, these formed out of gold, and they were the, referred to as the covering cherub. These positions of those gold cherubs were symbols of what actually exists up in heaven. And, the, and it is telling us in these passages that the original position of Lucifer, meaning Lucifer was the one who carries the light, was that he was next to the throne of God. This great contest between good and evil began with a being, my friend, who was right next to God who knew his character and he rebelled against it completely and totally. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways. Perfect in all your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Perfect in all your ways. <laughs> I mean, there's not one fashion designer in this world who wouldn't want to have that uh, that commendation given to them. Perfect in all your ways. Not the slightest thing wrong with him. Till iniquity. Till iniquity. You see, my friend, the Bible tells us that God is a God of love. You cannot have love unless you have options, unless you have alternatives. And you cannot have love unless there's free choice. The Bible tells us that our God is, the God of the Bible, is a God who, res 
respects freedom of choice. So much so that this being right next to his throne had the freedom to even rebel against him. I like the way it expresses it. Choices determine destiny. Choices determine destiny. My friend, choices determine destiny. And you and I have the freedom to choose. We have the freedom to choose so that we can relate to the situations happening around us, either positively, negatively, or whatever the case may be. And Lucifer became Satan by his own choice. And the evil that has come to this universe and to this world has come because of him. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupt. You cr lifted up because of your beauty. Have you ever seen a peacock? When I was a boy, my parents had peacocks who ran around the yard. <laughs> and our home had some glass windows right at the front. And when the sun was coming up in the morning, it shone against the windows and it created a mirror effect. Well, I've often seen we go to have breakfast, sit down at the table, and mom would bring out the meal and be sitting there with dad, and the peacock would come up. And the peacock couldn't see because it was a mirror, because of the light shining against it. And the peacock would raise his tail up and oh, gorgeous, beautiful, magnificent. It was an amazing sight when you see this beautiful peacock all fanned out in, in its beauty. Well, here it is. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. But you know, just like we say, <laughs> proud as a peacock, a peacock is not a very smart bird. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Now, friends, notice, just a moment ago, we read about Lucifer, Satan, being a deceiver. What does it mean to deceive? It means to cheat. It means to portray and pretend that you are something that you are not. It means to be dishonest. The Bible says that Lucifer, Satan, is a deceiver. You know what one of the deceptions are? The deception is to think that the devil is some ugly, wart-filled little imp that runs around and rests on your shoulder and is ready to stick you with a sword in your ear or something like that. It's a middle-age caricature a total misrepresentation, and it is exactly what Satan, Lucifer, wants us to believe about him. It comes from people who don't understand. It came from artists who do not understand the significance of what the Bible describes about the deceptiveness, the deceptiveness of this evil being and all of his evil fallen angels, because the Bible says it, uh, he took one third of the angels of heaven with him in his rebellion against God it serves exactly, exactly what the evil one wants us to think. Oh, first of all, there's no evil. Come on, there's no devil. Oh, no. Oh, friend, come on, just a minute here. We're looking through the eyes of Scripture to be able to see the supernatural, the other world, and the devil is a being according to prophecy, according to the Bible, according to the teachings of Jesus. The devil was a very real person, and he has the power to impersonate and to present himself exactly in the way that best suits his deceptive intents. The Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 described Lucifer, Satan, as the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air. Friend, if Lucifer wanted to, he can come in and present himself as the sophisticated, suave, educated, refined being that you could ever imagine. Or he can go right to the other extreme of the most brutal, horrible individual that is demonic in every way that you could imagine. Either way, all in between. Why? Because he is a deceiver. And he wants to deceive you and me and to take us away from our loyalty and allegiance to God. So let's go on a little bit further. We're going to go back to Revelation chapter 12. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his head. And then I stood on the sand of the sea. 
And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns, and on his head, a blasphemous name. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of the lion. Now, please notice those, those characteristics. There's a leopard, a bear, a lion, and then the dragon gave him his power. Now, here is where the book of Daniel and Revelation, again, exactly correlate with each other. If you were to go to Daniel chapter 7, and we don't have the time here tonight, we're going to study it in the future, you'll find that all four of those symbols are found in Daniel chapter 7. And here the Bible is describing how those things are connected together. All of the, um, let's see, you know, we've got to go back here. The dragon gave, the dragon, that's Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was, uh, excuse me, his, his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled, and one followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon. Who, who's the dragon? The dragon is Satan, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who's like the beast? Who's able to make war against him? It's impossible. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Now, friends, what is that telling us? Okay, there are symbols, but there's always a reality behind the metaphor. There's always a reality behind the symbol. And what the prophet John in this instance in the book of Revelation is seeing is the power of this charismatic, attractive, deceptive being called Satan who has the power to go out and the whole world wonders after the beast and says, who can compare with him? He's so strong. You see, my friends, here is where you and I begin to have the curtain drawn back from our eyes. And like being blocked like this, we begin to see the unseen. We see the real spiritual, supernatural powers that are behind this world of impacting the, the organizations, impacting the governments, impacting individuals. It is Satan who is at work in and through organizations in this world. The Bible refers to them as Baba, and it is when you and I understand this great spiritual battle that we begin to see the framework of which all of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are, are given. Going on, here we have three symbols, the dragon, the serpent, and then the Bible talks about a woman, a pure virtuous lady, she's pregnant. She's but nearly nine months pregnant. And she's about ready to give birth to a baby. Well, <laughs> here's another symbol. I want you to, to see the big picture here. And speaking of the dragon, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven. Fire was a sign in, ancient, uh, in the ancient biblical times of the power of God. So here's these signs. <gasps> oh, whoa, this is the power of God. It's not necessarily exactly fire itself, but people say, ooh, wow, they are wowed to believe that it is the power of God. It comes down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by means, by those signs which he, had gra he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth, quelling, what? telling those who dwell on the earth, that's you and me, friends to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword that lived. You see, friends, here we start to go from the unseen to the seen. Satan, working through all sorts of different agencies on this earth, is working to deceive you and me. You and me, and the organizations, and, the, and, and, and whatever they may be here on this, to actually implement a course of evil. That is the work of Satan. It's not the work of God. Now let's go on to another one. Remember this uh, symbol? I'm sure you've heard about it. If, you've, uh, if you have any interest in Daniel and Revelation at all, you've heard of 666 and the mark of the beast. Well, notice here in Revelation 13, verse 18. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. The beast. That's ultimately Satan working through organizations here on this earth. It's the number of a man, and his number is 666. He is triple human. Instead of 
being divine, it is triple humanism, triple independence from God. Now, okay, let's jump back to Daniel chapter 10. What I want you to see, friend, is that all the different ways throughout the book of Daniel and, and Revelation are the, is the great operation of this battle, this war, this controversy between good and evil. And then he said to me, don't fear, Daniel. Daniel had been praying and praying and praying. Daniel chapter 10. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I've come because of your words. Okay, let's stop right there. The Bible tells us that for three weeks, 21 days, Daniel had been praying, praying, praying. God, he was praying for understanding and insight. Because he, he recognized from his study of the Bible that prophecies were being fulfilled and his people might be returning back to, back to the land of Palestine, to Judea, to Judea. And so he praying, Lord, give me insight, give me understanding. And then it tells us from the very first day that your words were, the very first time that you began to pray, I heard about it, heaven heard of it. And I, we came to answer, three weeks have gone by. But, now catch this, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, okay, now here is this earthly power being controlled by this evil force, Satan's, the satanic power, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. You know, sometimes I, I have to admit, I pray once, pray twice, prayed three times, then I said, well, I guess I've prayed. God knows my prayers. Shrug my shoulder, let him take care of it. <laughs> Daniel didn't look at it the way. Daniel prayed for 21 days. He persevered in prayer. And you and I need to be people who persevere in prayer. Then why? Because there is a spiritual battle going on. And even though God hears our petitions, there are forces that are opposing and holding back the prince of the power of the air, of principalities, Ephesians 6. The ruler of this world, according to Jesus, is holding things back, holding things back. And so what happens? We find here what happened in Daniel's case. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the prince of Persia. Here we find heaven came to help this angel who was working on the hearts and minds of the king of Persia. Heaven went to work. <laughs> there is a real battle going on. Now let's look at that for a moment, friend, personally. Have you ever found yourself conflicted? You're, you have the best of intent, deepest desire to do what is right, you're created, you've studied and prepared, and yet inside of you there is some force that just wants to take you, so to speak, by the nose and jerk you around to do something that is evil. Maybe to steal. Maybe to look at pornography. Maybe to be engaged in some immoral act. I don't know. There are a whole catalog. The evil one has got an infinite amount of ways in which we can rebel against God. And so we find our refined, educated self conflicted with things within us. And somebody says, oh, that's just a matter of psychology and you need more training and, and better education. My friend, the last centuries here in the world have demonstrated some of the worst perpetrators of evil are the most highly educated individuals. Okay. The problem is in our minds and it's the influence of the supernatural on our minds where we are corrupted and God is wanting to work on hearts and minds. You see, there is this great spiritual battle that is taking place. And so on one hand, there is Satan. On the other hand, there is Jesus. And the question is, where is our faith going? Where do we choose to, who do we choose to follow? Uh, let, let's go on here. This pregnant lady that I was mentioned earlier ago, earlier, now is, now is a great sign appeared in heaven. A lady, a woman, clothed with the sun. Wow, that's pretty bright. With the moon under her feet. Obviously a supernatural symbol. It's a metaphor. Her, and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. That's quite a, quite a kingly crown, isn't it? And she being with child, cried out in labor and, gave, and in pain to give birth. You see? 
<laughs> Let's go back here for a second. This lady is being in labor, and the Bible tells us that this horrible dragon wants to destroy the wants to destroy this lady and the little baby. Okay, it's a symbol. Who is that? Well, we're going to discover, study that a little bit more. Now, going back a little bit further. Lucifer, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Remember a moment ago I mentioned about one third of the stars of heaven were followed Lucifer in his rebellion against God. He threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman. Here it is, we pick up the woman. The, the dragon stands before the woman who is ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God into his throne. See, down here on this earth, friends, there is a struggle, a battle going on over every person. Satan claims you and me, we're all in the same book, as his property. And Jesus, God, through the Holy Spirit, and the work of the angels, is tapping our shoulder, speaking to our mind, arranging circumstances, to bring our loyalty and allegiance to him. The purpose of prophecy, my friends, is to help us to see the eternal, to see heaven, to see the supernatural, to see behind the scenes. And one of the great things that prophecy is teaching us, you and me, my friend, is that there is a battle taking place for you and for me, and God wants you and me to be on his side. The issue is our loyalty and allegiance. Oh, now what? Notice here in Revelation 12. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. <laughs> what do those days represent? Friend, you're going to discover as we get into further into prophecies of what these, what these scale value, the scale value of a day, a year, and the prophecies. And you'll be amazed, friend, that the greatest prophecies in the world are actually confirmed by the very death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven and his heavenly ministry in heaven. Jesus authenticated these great prophecies by his blood himself. We, we can have huge confidence in the prophecies that are given. It says, and I saw the dragon, saw that he had been cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the, the serpent. So the serpent spewed out of his mouth water, out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon spewed out of his mouth. Friend, when you and I understand the phenomenal details of prophecy, we will discover that what is happening in this earth, the persecutions, the wars, the conflicts that are happening in many nations, and armies, and warlords, and militias, and all of these horrible things, is in reality, contest between good and evil. And Satan wants to do everything he can. The evil one wants to do everything he can to destroy us. The dragon was enraged with the woman. That's God's true people. And he went to make war with the last, the rest of, of her offspring. That's the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Ah, oh, friend, there is a battle, a, a contest. It was given authority to continue 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle. There's things happening on this earth that are directly blasphemous against God. We're going to discover what those are. And to those who dwell in the heaven, it was granted to him to make war with the saints. Here's persecution to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the, of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, we've taken a few moments here today to look at this big picture, the meta story. But the good news is this, the great news is this, that Jesus, our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> the work of the angels, are all working on our side, if we come to an understanding of the great themes, the lessons of prophecy, it gives us insight and understanding 
but it also helps us to know on which side we should be. Satan attacked God by misrepresenting his character because the real battle here is not with tanks and mortars and atomic bombs and missiles and, and drones and all those kind of things, my friend. It's the spiritual battle for our mind. And he, he attacked the character of God by creating evil, by creating pain, destruction, war, personal conflict, personal suffering, and he blamed it all on God. He messed up the environment, blamed it on God for making mistakes in creation. He created false religious systems that misrepresent service and worship of God. And there's millions of people today toiling under the great burden of somehow trying to prove themselves how to earn their, self, their merit, to become right with God by, on the basis of what they're doing rather than trusting in what God has provided for them. Love is the foundation of, of God's government, my friend. And when you and I understand how God is working in our world, he doesn't want robots. He's not just looking for performance people. He's looking for people whose heart is beating with his heart, <laughs> who loves him, who wants to serve him. He's given us the freedom to, cho to choose. Right back there in the garden, Eve had the freedom to choose. Today, you and I have the freedom to, cho to choose. And as God has given us the opportunity through the prophecies of the Bible, he helps us to learn these things so that we can intelligently seek to follow him. In closing, I want to wrap up with a text from the book of Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah was a... I was a, uh, a prophet who lived about 100 years before, before Jesus, uh, excuse me, before Daniel. And I appreciate one of the great texts in, in the, in the uh, book of, of Isaiah. And uh, <laughs> here he describes how every one of us can come to know him. And here in, I, in Isaiah chapter 1 it says, Come now, let us reason together. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall become white as snow. Let us reason together. One of the great things about prophecy is that God is speaking to our minds. And through the truths of the Bible, he gives us predictions of things that we can verify through the historicity, through the historical fulfillment. But it's congruent. It makes sense. It's consistent. And those truths become great themes that you and I can trust in. In October of 2023, war broke out. Another phase of the war broke out between the Palestinians, Gaza, and Israel. My friend, I'm not endorsing either side. War is war, and it's terrible, regardless of who's responsible for it. One of the things that was really amazing to me is when the war broke out and people recognized the threat <clears throat> that was going to happen to <clears throat> Israel or to Gaza, the Palestinians. All over the world, different demonstrations broke out. Some people got on a plane and flew immediately to Gaza or to Israel. Mm -hmm. Demonstrations were held, some pro-Israeli, some pro-Palestinian, pro either side. <laughs> not in, we're not endorsing war. But what they did demonstrated their loyalty of where their allegiance lies, one side or the other. And friend, the practical truth is, the practical application, the so what, of what it means for you and me is that God is inviting us to understand. Come now, let us reason together. And then, step by step by step by step, seek to follow him. The book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible says, The path of the just person is like the, I'm paraphrasing, like the sun coming up in the morning, gradually, step by step by step by step. And you and I, by God's grace, 
are on that path. And we're taking the steps to follow him. And today, I encourage you. God is speaking to your mind through the prophecies of Daniel Revelation. He's giving you insight and understanding. And you and I can be prepared for heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ and of following the, his way and letting him lead and guide our, our lives. Thank you. We'll see you next time as we take the next study in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Thank you for being with us. I hope my brother Ren, we get the message there. It's really clear. Yes, there is devil in this world, but Jesus is more powerful than devil, and we just cling on his promise that the signs are uh, happening. Let's just all be ready for his soon coming. Before we end up this, shall we all stand, please? And we will close by our prayer. Father God in heaven, we would like to thank you, Lord, for the message of hope that you have given to all of us tonight, not only us here in the sanctuary, but also to those who are in the Facebook Live or are watching online. We pray, Lord, that as the signs of your coming is here, help us, O oh Lord, that we will always submit ourselves to you. And be ready for your soon coming. Forgive us, Lord, in our shortcomings, in our sins, and cleanse us. Make us worthy to be called your children, sons and daughters, that is ready and fit for heaven. Thank you so much, Lord, for the assurance that in our way home we will receive your protection again. And may we keep the Sabbath day holy and bless all of us as we go to our respective church tomorrow to worship you. And thank you for answering our prayers and for your blessings to all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much to all of you, and see you again next time. Tomorrow there is another message from Pastor Bradthorpe. You can watch it also. Thank you.